Okay, so how is everyone today? <laughs> a couple people here today. <laughs> so, uh, last time mm, we were talking about functions, and we're still talking about functions. Uh, but, before we get there, just to remind you, of course, next week is spring break. That's terrific. Uh, also, perhaps just as important is what's happening on Tuesday in the break. It's March 14th. It's, it's Pi Day. <laughs> it's, oh, it's different meaning? Okay, well. Ah. <laughs> to every mathematician you know is going to be partying. <laughs> on Tuesday. <laughs> no math is going to get done. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, and then, when you come back from the break, on Thursday, what's happening? The exam. Okay. So the exam is on Thursday. It's at 7 at night. Uh, it's not in this room. <laughs> so I'll, I'll send a message probably on Monday, after the break, <clears throat> the Monday you get back. Uh, which will tell you what room you're going to be in. It's just going to be some big lecture hall on campus. Any question about any of that? <clears throat> okay, so let's get to it. We were talking about functions. So we drew some nice pictures with arrows and everything like that, and it's a nice, <clears throat> that's the conceptual model. It's probably best to have a function as sort of like a machine that accepts inputs and produces outputs. This is what it does. Uh, and in a sense, no matter how many times, you know, supposing that 2 was in the domain and 7 was in the range and the arrow from 2 went to 7, no, ma no matter how many times you put in a 2, it's going to give you a 7 every time. It's not going to get worn out. Okay? Always the same. So, <clears throat> that's actually not the most common kind of function that we'll deal with, the, the most common representation of function that we'll deal with. Rather. Uh, the most common representation of functions is the following. A function <coughs> can be defined by an expression. <coughs> okay, so for example, I could say that this is the definition of f of x. It's a function defined by the expression uh, 3x squared plus 2. So supposing that we're dealing with the function f defined in that way, I could say, please evaluate um, f of, say, 2. So what is it that I'm asking you to do? <coughs> yeah, everywhere you see an x, I want you to replace it with a 2. So, okay, that would be 3 multiplied by 2 squared mm, plus 2. And then now you carry out some arithmetic. This is 14. Any question about this? Okay. Uh, suppose I say, okay, I want you to evaluate... 10. F at 10. <clears throat> well, this is the same thing, right? With a, with a different number. So 3 times 10 squared and then add 2. Well, that would be 302. <clears throat> Any question about this? So I have a question for you. What if, what if I said, okay, now I want you to evaluate f at 2? Well, no work is necessary anymore, right? Because we already established that it's 14. No matter how many times you put a 2 in there, 14 is going to come out. Okay. How about f evaluated at... 5a. So now what is it that I'm asking you to do? <coughs> Same thing. Same thing. Only right. So now I'm going to write 
something that many students write, but it is an error. 3 times 5a squared plus 2. This is wrong. What's wrong with it? Right. It's that notice that the thinking of a function as a machine with inputs and outputs, so the mathematician's name for the input is called argument. So right here, for for this evaluation right here, what is the argument? Ten. And what is the argument here? Five A. So it is the argument that needs to be squared which means that it, it must be the case that 5a is what's being squared. Presently, the way I've written it, what is being squared? Just the a, right? Because of the order of operations, parentheses, exponents, multiply, blah, blah. So this exponentiation with the a occurs before this multiplication with the 5. So to make it right, to make it right, you have to parenthesize this. Now, the general rule is, is that when you're performing a substitution, if the thing being substituted in consists of more than one symbol, like 5 is one symbol and A is another symbol, if it consists of more than one symbol, then you must parenthesize it in order to be correct. Okay. <clears throat> so, if you were to do that, that would be, well, 5 squared is 25 times 3 is 75, so 75 a squared plus 2. Any question about this one? Okay, how about f of a plus 5? Now what? Okay, I'm... I think, I'm, I think you're saying the right thing, but I'm not entirely sure. So, so, what's going to happen here is that this thing is just called argument. Okay, that's its abstract name. So, the structure of this function means that it's got to look like this. Which is to say, I'm covering this up currently. Like maybe we haven't decided just what we're going to put in there. Whatever it is that I uncover, that's what has to be written here. <coughs> and if it was a banana, we'd have to faithfully copy a banana in there and, and then square a banana, whatever that means, right? So whatever I reveal here, that's what must be written here. Okay, and, w and A plus 5 is there, so that's what needs to be written. So is there any question why it looks just so? Okay, so then now we need to square that. Uh, we need, supposing that the instruction said, and I want you to simplify it as much as possible, then a plus 5 all squared is what? Not quite. So a squared plus 25 over here, and then plus 10a in the middle. So that's the part that I thought you might have been leaving out. So the, re the reason is because square expo exponents do not distribute over addition. But they do distribute over product. Which is to say, if you wanted to carry this out, you'd have to foil this, right? A times A, A times 5, 5 times A, so that's why you get 5a and another 5a, 10a, and then 5 times 5. And then so now you collect 3a squared plus 30a plus 77. Any question about this? Okay, let's have another one. So slightly more interesting. 
perhaps. How about I give you, uh, say, g of x, because not every function needs to be named f. Uh, how about g of x is 2x squared plus 5x minus 11. And then I ask of you to evaluate the following. So how about g of... Mm, um, I don't know, x plus h. So that's a little disturbing. It's a little disturbing because in g's definition, we've got x's. And I'm asking you to replace something that has x's in it with something else that has x's in it. And that can be a little bit disturbing, but you need to understand that this x has nothing wh whatsoever to do with that x, actually. They're completely and utterly not related. So, so the structure of this expression is that it's got x's there and there in two places. So the substitution that must occur will look like this. Okay, because what what G does by definition is it takes argument, squares it, multiplies by two, and then adds 5 times the argument and then subtract 11. So what I'm saying is whatever I reveal under here, whatever I reveal, that's what needs to be copied into those two slots. Is there any question about why the way why it goes just this way? Okay, so then what is revealed is x plus h. Okay, so now let's faithfully copy x plus h into those positions. And now supposing it says collect, you know, simplify, collect, and all that. Okay. Well, what is x plus h squared? Yes, and plus h squared. Very good. And then plus 5x plus 5h, and then minus 11. And then multiply it through. So 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared, plus 5x, plus 5h, minus 11. Any question about this? <clears throat> okay. Uh, how about, um, hmm. How about if I add another function into the mix and say that we've got um, m of x is 3x plus 7. Okay. <clears throat> and now I ask, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to do m of g of x. So now we're putting functions in fun inside of other functions. Right? <laughs> OK. Well, really, it's structurally exactly the same as you just start from the outside and say, well, who, who's, and you peel it like an onion. So who's on the outside? M, right? So then now you look at, you ignore what's inside of it, 
and you just say, okay, well, what do, what exactly does m do? Well, it's going to take its argument and then do three argument plus seven. So it's going to look like three argument plus seven. Okay, so does everyone agree that it has to end up looking like this? So now whatever it is that I reveal, that's what needs to be put into position. And a g of x is revealed. So I'm just going to copy g of x. Just g of x. But now, oh, there's, I can see that now that I've done that, there's more substitution that can, that can happen. So 3, and what I can do is give myself a larger uh, set of parentheses here. And now I can replace this g of x with its actual definition, all that business. So then 2x squared plus 5x minus 11. Okay, any question getting to this position? Okay, so then uh, now it can distribute. So this would be like 6x squared uh, plus 15x minus 33 and then add 7, so minus 26. Any question about this? Okay. So then, as if this wasn't sort of disturbing enough uh, on its own, then I could say, well, what if, what if I say I want you to do m of m of x? So a lot of students start dropping out here and saying, no, <laughs> no, I was... I was uncomfortable on two, and now I'm just I'm just out. Okay, so I suspect the reason is that you see all these m's, and you say, well, I know that m has defined with x's, and then no, I'm replacing x's with m of x's, but then there's x's with that m of x, and you know it's all kind of it can get a, it can become a jumble. But in the end, what I want you to understand is that this is addressed in exactly the same way that is addressed, like an onion. Okay. You just say, what's, what's on the outside? M is on the outside. So let's ignore the inside for a minute. And just look at what M would do to whatever happens to be in it. To whatever happens to be in there. Okay, well, it's going to do 3 argument plus 7. That's what it's going to do. So 3 argument plus 7. And then whatever it is that I reveal in here, that's what I've got to write in there. And does everyone agree to here? So now you just, now you finally take a look at it and say, oh, it's an m of x. That's surprising because I just did that. But that's what has to be written. But if the instructions say completely evaluate and simplify, then, well, you can perform more substitution. You can say, okay, I guess I can go a little further. Three, and then what goes in there? Three x plus seven. And then now you can multiply out and collect like terms. 9x plus 28. Now, what's fun to realize and understand is that, well, if I can put a function inside of a function, then that means that I can put a function inside of a function inside of a function, right? 
we can't, there's no end to the to the rabbit hole. It just goes as deep as you wish to go. But I claim that that's kind of obvious because because if you have the consideration and the the mental model of functions being machines functions being machines then you could then you can imagine it like this is that here we have an assembly line where we've got a G machine and then an F machine okay so then Suppose that, that an X is traveling down the assembly line, you know, and then it goes in and then the G machine makes a whirring sound, and then out comes a G of X. So now there's a G of X walking down this assembly line, or traveling down the assembly line, and then it goes into the F machine and then it makes a, its own whir, whirring sound, and then out comes what? f of g of x, right? And now in your mind's eye, just imagine an assembly line. Like if you've ever ever seen a picture of, say, like a auto, an automobile uh, assembly line. It has lots and lots and lots of steps, right? Well, as many steps as necessary. f of g of m of k of whatever. Okay. Also, another thing with this mental model that you need to, that we're just a, as a matter of foreshadowing, I'm not going to really address it today, but soon, is that when you put functions inside of functions like this, the order is going to matter, right? Which is to say that if the X goes through the G machine first and then the F, that's potentially different than going through the F machine first and then the G. In the same sense that, for example, uh, when you get dressed in the morning, it doesn't matter which sock you put on first, the left sock or right sock. In the sense that if you were to if if you were all to submit to inspection right now, I would not be able to look at you and be able to tell which sock you put on first. Okay? Pants and underwear are a different matter, right? Okay, and the one order is 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 what's typically done in polite society, and the other order is Superman, right? And it's easy to tell which order it occurred in, right? So, so the order of functions is going to matter. Okay, good. Any question about this? Okay, finally, or not finally, but next. I could say, okay, how about f of x is 3x squared plus 5x minus 9. And I want you to evaluate f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So now, I want you to do, I want you to do all of this, right? In the end, that's what I want. But it's kind of a complicated thing to deal with. It's a, it's a big thing. So let's break it down into pieces, right? Because how do you eat a whale? One bite at a time, right? <laughs> Same way you eat anything. So. So let's break it into pieces and say, okay, let's just do this piece for a moment. Let's just do the red piece. Okay. So just doing the red piece. I want to do f of x plus h. Well, this is not so different than an example that we did a couple pages ago, right? So I need to take this f, and everywhere I see x's, I replace with x plus h's. So 
x plus h all squared, and then plus 5 x plus h, and then minus 9. Is there any question why the substitution looks the way it does? So that would be 3 x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 5x plus 5h minus 9. <coughs> and then 3x squared plus 6xh plus 3h squared plus 5x plus 5h minus 9. Okay, any question getting to there? So now that we've done that part, that big part, now more or less the rest of it is done, right? Because that is just that, right? So, so this blue thing, this blue bit, there's nothing to do for that because it's just sitting right there. So <clears throat> f of x plus h minus f of x divide by h. Okay, so we, we need to substitute in the red and the blue things. So that would be 3x squared plus 6xh plus 3h squared plus 5x plus 5h minus 9. And then now I'm going to subtract, that's the red bit, minus that stuff. 3x squared plus 5x minus 9. All of this over h. Okay, so I have a question. Have I done it right? Nope. What's not right about this? Well, I mean, it, it looks like this. That's the red bit, that's the blue bit. I think we all can agree that's the red bit, so I put the red bit there. And that's the blue bit, so I put the blue bit there. And that's the minus... So I put the minus there. Is it not? Nevertheless, what's wrong with this? Yes? Yeah. Because remember what the rule was on the very first page. We said anytime you're going to substitute something in, if it consists of more than one symbol, then you need to parenthesize it. So how about it? Does the, is that more than one symbol? Yeah? And how about that one? Also yeah, right? So then... So there's two items about this, and that is that in the first place you've got to remember that you're supposed to parenthesize things. So that's, that's one matter. And I think most people can remember that. But here's the other problem, which is why I always talk, this is my hypothesis, and, and why I always talk about it, is that, okay, suppose I add red parentheses to this, because it was the red group. Well, actually, those red parentheses don't do anything. Which is to say, before I wrote them, the expression is the same as after. They make no difference, actually. But now, for the blue group, for the blue group, if I write parentheses around it, notice that presently, what is being, is, is this 5x being subtracted? Presently. No, it's not. And that's the problem, because we're supposed to be subtracting all of that. We're supposed to be subtracting that, and we're supposed to be subtracting that, and we're supposed to be subtracting that. These blue parentheses do make a difference. They make a difference. And so, you know, I think everyone can remember that you're supposed to parenthesize substituted elements. But the problem is, is that sometimes you actually don't have to. Like these red ones, you didn't need to do that. But the blue ones, you do. And so psychologically, any time that something is like that, where you only have to do something some of the time, or to put it more 
precisely when you can get away with something some of the time. Most of the time, people try and get away with it all the time. <laughs> so that's a, that's that was borne out in, in various experiments, including something called a Skinner box, if, if you know what that is, <laughs> if you ever take a psychology class. Okay, so any question about why it has to be parenthesized? Finally, I'd like to point out that haven't I spent about mm, two minutes talking about this? And that is because, having taught this course a number of times, okay, I've witnessed so many points evaporate because of exactly this. Okay. <clears throat> so now, uh, there's a great deal of cancellation that can occur. So this 3x squared can cancel with that one. Uh, 5x, this 5x cancels with that 5x. And how about the negative 9s? Do they cancel? Yeah, right? Because it's negative 9 minus a negative 9. So that's 0. So what remains is anything that doesn't have an h, in fact. Uh, right. <laughs> everything that's canceled is the stuff that doesn't have it. And everything that remains is stuff that does. Okay. So 6xh. 6xh uh, plus 3h squared plus 5h. And then over h. Now I'd like for you to observe that the numerator, uh, every term has an h. So we could factor an h out. And that would become 6x plus 3h plus 5, and then multiply by h, and then divide by h. And now I have a question for you, is it night? Can you cancel those h's? <laughs> and the answer is no. You can't. <laughs> now, why not? Why not? Well, let's go ahead and do it and look at the difference. So if we were to cancel, then the result will be 6x plus 3h plus 5. And so what I'm saying is that you can't cancel the h's because in fact these things are not equivalent. Why is this thing not equivalent to that thing? Not quite. So just remember that remember that a cancellation fundamentally is a division. It's a division that's occurring. Okay? And any time division occurs, you have to be suspect. Things could go wrong. What could possibly go wrong with division? Divide by zero. Divide by zero. So consider, can this expression be evaluated at h is 0? Yeah. It would be 6x plus 5, because that term would go away. So you could, pl you could plug h equal to 0 into this one. Can you plug h equal to 0 into that one? No, you can't. Because it would, it would read 0 over 0 after you do that. So you, you, you can plug h into this one. You cannot plug h into that one. Okay. So now, to, to legitimize this, I'll write, a, I'll write a clause up here. I'll say, I want you to evaluate this. assuming that h is not 0. So does everyone see now that what, what, what this red clause does? It legitimizes having moved from here to here. Now it's legitimate. So that's possible because of this. Interesting. So this computation 
where you take a function and you you make this expression f of x plus h minus f of x over h is an exceedingly common um, calculation that you must perform in the next class that you might take calculus so if you're planning on taking calculus then you will do <laughs> you'll do this a lot for about mm, maybe about a week you'll do this over and over and over again you'll take this you'll take this function and do that then you get another function and do that <laughs> Take another function and do that. <laughs> you just keep doing it over and over. And that, as much as I would love to go on to, s to say why this is such a central topic in calculus, we have to just leave it here and go on to something else. Any question about this? <clears throat> so just for those of you who want are intrigued by that, this particular expression is called a difference quotient. Dif Difference quotient. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the things we're going to do with functions is we're going to start cataloging um, their behaviors and appearances and things like that. So let's consider the function f of x is equal to x. So this is a particularly easy function, right? It's really, in, in, in the machine analogy of machines that are connected together by assembly lines, this is really like just an, a piece of assembly line, right? Because what, <laughs> what if you put in a 5? What would come out? A 5, right? Or, or what if you put in a negative 5? A negative five, right? It's just like it's just like part of the assembly line, right? A banana goes in, you hear a whir and a sawing sound, like, and then out out comes a banana on the other side, right? It's exactly the same. Okay, so if we do this, I could say in the first place, please make a table. So how about negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, one, two, So I think, I think the instructions are self-evident probably, but it, specifically I'm saying I want you to take this, this x and put it in the function and tell me what comes out. Okay, so negative 3, negative 2. Negative one, zero, one, two, three. So now we're going to take this. And we're going to plot y is f of x. Which is to say, I want you to construe f of x as being a y value. Those are the points. So there we plotted seven points. And if instead we plotted 700 points or something like that, it would be just like connecting the dots. Like so. So this is a line, obviously. This is a line with slope 1, because rise over run, 1 over 1. And it has intercept, y-intercept, 0. OK. So now, how about
plug in my camera. I'm getting a warning here. Okay. Okay. So now f of x is x squared. So now we're going to plot this. First to table. So how about negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. Okay, so I'd like to point out something, and that is that, well, this is probably the easiest one to do, <laughs> right there, and then if you move to the right, you get 1, and then 4, and then 9. And notably, what I'd like for you to observe is that now if we go back to here, and from here go to the left, what do we get? one, and then four, and then nine. And so what is the name of these things <laughs> that are read the same forward and backwards? Palindrome, right? It's read the same forwards and backwards. So the symmetry, the fact that it can be read the same forwards and backwards, when you plot it, you'll see that occurring. plot this. Okay. So, zero, zero, one, one, two, four, and then we fall off the top edge, right? If we go any further. And then negative one, positive one, negative two, positive two. And then we fall off. So notably, the fact that the fact that this is a palindrome read the same forwards and backwards means that once you have these three points, then their counterparts are just reflected on the other side, like that. So this one paired with that one that one paired with that one and then there'd be a nine way up here right something something like way up here and it would be paired with this one okay so now if we connect the dots So this shape is so common, it has its own name. What's its name? Parabola. OK. Now I'm going to do exactly this example, except I'm going to do it with, instead of x with exponent 2, I'm going to do it x with exponent 3. So otherwise, exactly the same. Except, on the previous two examples, I started with negative 3 and went to positive 3. But already, that, that's really not going to work, right? Because, because what's 3 cubed? 27. And that, that'd be way, way off. So now, to be a little bit more conservative in the size of the x's. So how about negative 2, 
negative one and a half, negative one, negative half, zero, half, one, one and a half, two. Okay. So now if I do the same strategy again, and start with zero. Then let's let's move to the right. So this is half. Well, what's half cubed? Half of half is a fourth. So half of half of half is an eighth, which is which is zero point one two five is an eighth. Okay, one cubed, I can do that, that's one. So what's one and a half cubed? Well, one and a half, one and a half, one and a half is two and a quarter. And then one and a half, two and a quarters is 3.375. <laughs> Very good. And then two cubed, that's eight. So, as far as I'm concerned, you can just do that arithmetic with your calculator. Okay, now, just like we were, we were just at a position like this with the, with the parabola, and we we noted that ah yeah we just start here and then we can just read them going backwards the other way, so that it was a palindrome. Now something like that, but not exactly like that, also occurs here. What happens here? <laughs> Yeah, now we read the exact same numbers going backwards, except they're negated. Now, why did we not have the, why, why do we have the negative here, but we didn't the last time? It's odd, right? The odd exponent preserves the, the, the SIGN of the number. So negative half cubed, that'd be negative an eighth. This would be negative one, negative 3.375 and negative 8. So the fact that it's kind of an anti-palindrome, if you like, that it's, these, are the, these are the same as those except they're negated, except they're negated, you'll see that show up in the plot. Zero, zero, and then half, 1.25, then one, one, then one and a half, three, three, seven, five, and then two, eight is already off, so that'd be way up, way up there somewhere. So if it was exactly a palindrome, we would flip over to this side and start finding their counterparts and plotting them. But we're not only going to have to flip to, to that side, we're also going to have to flip how? Across the x-axis, down. So it's going to look like this. Yeah. And if we were to plot lots and lots of points, then it would look like this. So it is kind of like someone took a parabola and grabbed its left arm and twisted it down a little bit. So we're not going to do it, but I want you to imagine now. What if we did the exact same exercise now with x to the 4? It would be more like a parabola in the sense that both of its arms would be up, right? Why, why, why will both arms be up? because it has an even exponent, right? Because, for example, negative 2 to exponent 4, well, that'd be negative 2 times negative 2, which is positive 4, multiplied by negative 8, I'm oh, sorry, multiplied by negative 2, which is negative 8, 
and then multiplied by negative 2 one more time, which is positive 16. So here's the, here's the punchline to this line of reasoning. One of the first things we're going to do when we come back from the break is we're going to consider families of functions. And here we have listed the first three members of a specific family. is to say f of x is x, f of x is x, f of x is x, f of x is x. And then now I write the exponents. So this will be with exponent 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4. So we did the first three. They look like this. Notice that 1 is odd, and like the cubic, it has one arm up and one down. The next one is like the parabola, except it will be flatter near the origin and steeper away from the origin. So, if I was to give you a plot that looked like this one. And I said that which is more, and, and that's all that I gave you, and I didn't, there weren't tick marks or nothing. I just gave you something that looks like this. And I said, what is more reasonable? That this is the plot of x to 8 or x to 9? It's more reasonable to be x to 9 because 9 is odd, and this one has one arm up and one arm down. Okay, have a nice break.